So how's everybody doing this morning? Good? Yeah. Well, welcome to the, we are, okay. uh, panel on energy transition. That worked pretty well. I thought I'd have to try that twice before I got a response. <laughs> and uh, you folks are awake this morning. That's good. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm John, uh, not John Leon. <laughs> See, don't tell John I said that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, it, it is early in the morning. I'm Lee Kump. I'm the John Leone Dean of the College of Earth and Mineral Sciences, and I'm glad to welcome you here to this uh, panel. The uh, discussion today is in partnership with Bonnie Forge. You see Bonnie Forge listed here. They're a recognized leader in, in the marketing and manufacturing of Forge steel valves, cast steel valves, forge fittings, branch connections, and other related products that uh, they use to, to satisfy their uh, customers. And uh, we have a very close relationship with um, Bonnie Forge. And, um, and uh, conversations like this, other things that we've been doing at Penn State around energy leadership have uh, been made possible by the Leon family and the strong support they've provided to our Department of Energy and Mineral Engineering and in um, endowing the Dean's position at, at Penn State. So we really do thank them for facilitating um, activities like this. Before we begin today's session, I'd like you to know that this is being recorded and the recording will be distributed in our post-meeting event message. We asked attendees to submit questions via, um, via the registration link, and we've had a tremendous response. And so what that means now is that we're going to be unable to actually um, uh, take questions from the audience live because we really want to address those questions that, that you've um, posed in advance. We will keep the registration link open, and so um, and we'll strive to answer all of the questions that were posed. I think we had 27 questions that we will only be able to get through a fraction of those today. So, um, but the panel has agreed to strive to answer your uh, questions offline once we um, once this once this um, uh, event is over, and we'll have a transcript of those that'll be provided to you. Well, as you all know, the world is in the grips of several transitions in the energy sector, global economic order, and the way we approach racial and other economic disparities. The transition in the energy sector is coupled with other existential questions such as global climate change. And this has placed a renewed emphasis on sustainability and conservation. Developing new concepts in sustainable energy systems science and engineering, revisiting our legacy in conventional energy production areas, and promoting new approaches in petroleum system science and engineering, facilitating a global energy and technology transition in an economically and environmentally sustainable way through mining and environmental system science and engineering. These are all essential aspects of this energy transition. It is also evident that the transition in society that's taking place um, in the use of our energy resources will um, we'll see our current and future graduates of Penn State and, and in other areas experiencing tremendous change throughout their careers. So transformations in our curricula are also essential during this period of energy transition. So managing a transition towards a sustainable energy future will require substantial deployment of new technology and the market and policy frameworks to support that deployment. Researchers from the John and Willie Leone Family Department of Energy and Mineral Engineering are at the forefront of research into the energy transition spanning economics, law, policy, science, and engineering. An interdisciplinary group of leading energy scholars from EME will share their thoughts today on what it will actually take to make the global energy systems more sustainable while powering a world with billions of energy hungry people. So each of our panelists has provided us a brief overview of the area of expertise they would like to share today. After all have presented, we'll move into the Q&A session with the panelists to answer those questions that were provided during the registration. I, I'm, I'm sorry to report that um, Sanjay Srinivasan will not be able to join us today. His father passed away over the weekend, and so um, he's taking a, um, an understandable break from activities, although he has uh, been able to participate in some of some of our meetings over the course of, of, of the week so far. So we're, we're, um, we're very sorry about that. But I would like to introduce Chiara Lopretta. Chiara is an Associate Professor of Energy Economics and Associate Head for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in, in the EME Department. 
Her expertise is in applied econometrics, electrical, electric mar electricity market design, energy economics and policy, and modeling of electricity and natural gas systems. Geopolitics focuses on the shifting balance and rising tensions among nations. Fossil fuels have been the foundation of global energy systems, shaping the geopolitical map over the last two centuries. The growing and uh, deployment of low carbon energy technologies involves a deep transformation of the global energy landscape that will have profound geopolitical implications, altering relations between states, affecting the global distribution of power, and creating new vulnerabilities. Kiara will discuss these far reaching effects on energy markets with a focus on electricity grids. So Kiara, we look forward to your thoughts on this area of the energy transition. Take it away. So thank you, Dean Kump, for the introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here. I hope, yeah, does it sound okay? Yeah. Um, so uh, I would like to start my remarks by giving a very brief introduction of this term that we hear about a lot, which is geopolitics, right? What, what is geopolitics? If you, if you go to the Oxford um, Dictionary, <laughs> that defines geopolitics as politics, especially international relations as influenced by geographical factors. And so every great transition in energy technology entails a shift in, in geopolitics. If you start thinking about James Watt's uh, coal-fired steam engine that gave rise to industri industrialization, right, and enabled uh, Britain's uh, global hegemony in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Then on the eve of World War I, uh, Winston Churchill made the historic decision to shift the power source of the British Navy's ships from coal to oil. And that was to make the fleet more like faster than its German counterpart. And since then, of course, the control of oil became key to military and geopolitical power. And oil was, of course, at the core of the American century. The transition from solid fuels to and oil to natural gas began a little bit later, right, in the mid of the 20th century, when um, natural gas became a major fuel in residential heating in vast parts of Europe and North America. It's worth remembering that in the 70s and 80s, despite the strong opposition of the Reagan administration, Europe pursued the construction of gas, natural gas pipelines from Russia, which basically represented the main supply route that, to the continent until uh, 2021. The over-reliance on uh, Russian natural gas supplies only started to be considered a geopolitical threat in 2006 and 2009 when natural gas disputes between Russia and Ukraine led to the halt of Russian natural gas gas supply to Europe uh, via Ukraine, which of course was the main transit route. So overall, for over two centuries, interstate relations have been profoundly influenced by the distribution of energy resources and the technologies of their utilization. And control over fossil fuels has been deeply intertwined with issues of energy security. It played a central role in several wars and coups to, to install client regimes and led to tensions, of course, um, erupting in major energy crises. Now, the transition towards renewable energy is taking place not because we're running out of fuels, despite claims to the contrary, but in response to the challenge of global warming. In December 2015, um, UN member states adopted the Paris Agreement to limit the long-term increase in average global temperatures to below two degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial levels. And they actually aim to limit the increase to 1.5 degrees or less by 2100 to improve the climate, the, the prospects of climate safety. Now, to have a likely outcome of 1.5 degrees or less, the world as a whole must achieve net zero greenhouse gases, greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And what that means is that the world must build an economy 
that emits no more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere than, unper than unpermanently removed and stored each year. Now, so far, the world is off track, moving towards warming of 2.5 degrees or higher by 2100, based on the most recent projections from the International Energy Agency. The IEA notes that a huge increase in energy investment is essential to get on track to net zero emissions by 2050. And just to give you some numbers, um, from $1.3 trillion today, clean energy investment is expected to rise above $2 trillion by 2030, based on today's policy settings, but it would have to be above $4 trillion by the same date in the net zero emissions by 2050 scenario. A key challenge, I'm sure we'll get to this later, but a key challenge to in achieving decarbonization is global political cooperation to get the job done. More than 70 countries have committed to reaching net zero now, including big polluters like the US and the European Union that together represent about 20% of greenhouse gas emissions. But even if the US and Europe get there, we won't have solved the problem, right? And, and that's because three quarters of the global population lives in emerging economies like China and India, and although historically these economies played a very small role in causing climate change, they're now responsible for about two thirds of the global greenhouse gas emissions. So, and, and China just by itself emits more than one quarter of these emissions. So solutions have to work in all countries, otherwise the average global temperatures will continue to rise. So what explains some of this political resistance to change? Of course, one argument um, is free riding, right? You, you often hear about this in, in econ classes. Each nation tries to get the others do the hard work and bear the incremental costs. But another point is that the transition causes impacts on several geopolitical dimensions. So geopolitical is at play, geopolitics is at play here. For example, um, many fossil fuel rich countries, in particular those with less diversified economies that rely heavily on oil and gas revenues, stand to lose from the transition. And besides the obvious capital and economic losses, they, they will lose geopolitical leverage advantages because their concentrated holdings of fossil fuels will be supplanted by access to um, zero carbon energy sources. And of course, geopolitical issues extend well beyond the control of fossil fuels. Analysts and policymakers for some time now have recognized that Clean energy technologies rely on a number of critical materials whose supply chains are not well diversified. These mineral sources are also unequally distributed around the globe, and many observers expect intense rivalry and geopolitical competition over the global supply lines for these minerals. And some are saying also that as with the past century's wars over oil, this century could see new wars over the mineral inputs to the energy economy. So my research <laughs> integrates methods from economics, optimization, and statistics to develop quantitative models of energy systems and markets with a focus on electricity. But most works on energy geopolitics stem from the discipline, from the field of international relations. So how can an energy system modeler like myself contribute to, to, to this field, to the field of the geopolitics of the energy transition, which is still in its infancy, by the way. It's something that just recently has received attention 
from the academic literature, at least. Well, so one geopolitical issue that has received little attention so far, but I think seems to deserve closer scrutiny as we move forward, is the impact of electricity interconnection on international relations and geopolitics. And specifically, let me tell you the questions that are on my mind. The first one is, in what context some countries could use electricity as an energy weapon to wrest political concessions? We're used to seeing this with oil and natural gas, but we don't know whether, and again, in what context this could happen with electricity. And the second question is, what consequences the weaponization of electricity could have in a world where international electricity interconnection are on the rise, primarily for political reasons, and where electricity demand is expected to more than double to reach net zero by 2050. And at that time, electricity will represent about 50% of the global final energy consumption. What I'm talking about is actually not that far-fetched. And we've seen recent examples of electricity being used as a weapon. Um, you can um, think about the Russian approach towards the Baltic state's synchronization with the continental European network. So Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia aim to synchronize their electricity grids with Europe by 2025. This development will end the management of the Baltic state's power grids that is currently managed by, by Russia. And this is done through a centralized dispatch of a very wide area synchronous transmission grid, which is called IPS UPS. Now, the Baltic states also plan on discontinuing electricity trading with Russia once the synchronization is complete. And of course, as you can imagine, Russia has been opposing the project due to geopolitical considerations and economic interests. And what's interesting is that Russia started developing strategic energy infrastructure to prepare for the desynchronization of the Baltic states from IPS to UPS before they are ready to do so themselves. And after the infrastructural upgrades on the Russian side are completed, Russia will be in a position to credibly threaten to prematurely cut the Baltic states from the network, which could cause severe blackouts, not just in the Baltic states, but, but in Europe as well. And of course, this would be done in order to achieve the primary objective, which is either stopping the synchronization altogether, or at the very least, delaying its implementation. Using electricity as a weapon is distinct from carrying cyber attacks. I'm not, of course, you could do it with cyber attacks too, but cyber attacks have been studied, right? And they, they've received attention in, in the literature. So I'm talking specifically about electricity trade and the use of grids as, as weapon. You could ask, why is it different from oil and gas? The use of oil and gas as weapons is also studied, right? But I would argue that the physical characteristics of energy sources imply that you can't just use all energy sources as a weapon in the same way. Specifically with respect to electricity, a key difference with oil and gas is you can't store large amounts of electricity in economic ways right now, right? You need to balance supply and demand at all times and all locations on, on the grid. And so any interruptions are gonna have cascading effects. And again, a, another big difference is that you don't even need to be a very large electricity exporter to be able to trigger these cascading effects. So including the 
infrastructure element of the grid uh, in, the, in an analysis of energy geopolitics might seem strange uh, from a tra traditional geopolitics, geopolitical perspective, but it seems also essential to try to fully understand the implications of, of using electricity as, as, a, as a weapon. So just to, to conclude, the geopolitics of the energy transition will involve a very intense and, and highly disruptive era of international relations. The geopolitical relevance of electricity has traditionally been underestimated, but deserves closer scrutiny. Uh, given electricity's increasing role in, in the future. It's worth noting that China is driving electricity interconnectivity uh, with its Belt and Road Initiative um, that you, you, many of you are familiar with. Uh, they, China actually proposed the creation of a global energy grid, which is still a very distant possibility uh, that may have technical limitations due to transportation losses and, and things. But, but nevertheless, this raises exactly the types of concerns that, that I've briefly discussed uh, today. And so I think this is an area that would benefit from more research, in particular interdisciplinary research um, that involves economists, engineers, and, and also political scientists. And, and this is a direction in which I would like to move, um, I'd like to explore uh, more in, in, my go in my work uh, going forward. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Kara. <laughs> okay, uh, next I'd like to introduce Mort Webster. Mort is um, online with us today. And, and um, he is a professor of energy engineering and associate department head for graduate education in EME. His expertise is in stochastic multi-stage optimization algorithms, electric power systems planning and operations, and coupled energy water land modeling for resiliency studies. The need for a low carbon and resilient energy system that is also low cost and reliable calls for new technologies and new market structures. There remains considerable uncertainty in which technologies will be best, in what the future costs will be, and the best transition path to get there. Finally, future energy systems that rely more on renewables will need to manage variability and uncertainty on daily and hourly timescales. Mort will provide an overview of some of the research at Penn State into alternative technology pathways and new energy market designs to better manage the short-term and long-term uncertainty. Mort is, as I mentioned, joining us virtually, so he'll now share his win particular window into the energy transition. Mort? Yes, thank you, Lee. Can, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I, I apologize, I can't turn the camera on for some reason, but um, thank you very much. Um, I. First, I apologize for not being down there. I wish I could be down there and, and interacting with you all. Um, but thank you for letting me uh, join you in this way, remotely at least. So <clears throat> let me um, take a step back um, from my comments and take the, the name of this panel, um, the title of Energy Transition, and um, I'm not there to see any show of hands, but I, but I wonder in the audience, how many of you have seen these lovely pictures that some organizations draw where they take the share of different energy sources and fuels today, and they draw these nice straight lines in different colors right to 2050, where they have show the perfect shares of solar and renewable and battery and some some organizations will include fossils, some will not. And they say, that's what you need. And here, we're just gonna go there on a straight line. So um, I'm guessing that many of you have seen these pictures. Um, <clears throat> I wanna propose a different way of thinking about this issue of the energy transition. And the key word here is uncertainty, um, as the Dean just said. So um, what 
the work I'm going to tell you about for a couple minutes um, is about a different way of thinking about this challenge of the energy transition. The, rather than trying to say, I'm going to predict what will happen or what should happen, uh, let's say by 2050 to have a, a low carbon energy system. Instead, what you want to do is consider a wide range of uncertainties and how different technologies may develop how markets and economics may change, how regulations might change between now and the future. And the real goal is to think about what is, what is a robust, flexible first step in that path that allows you to pivot um, and make adjustments as the real world evolves in ways that you didn't necessarily expect. Just to give a brief analogy outside of, of the technical areas, um, if, for example, if you were trying to drive, I don't know how many of you are local in the audience, but if you were trying to drive from Houston, let's say up to Austin, uh, when I look at the map, I can see there are several sort of major roads, right? You could go on I-10, you could go on Route 290. The, the best way to pick your route if you have to go to a meeting in Austin by the end of the day is not to decide exactly which streets the last couple of turns you're going to make inside the city and lock that in and never revisit it. Your decision when you're leaving Houston is, am I going to start out on I-10 or am I going to start out on Route 290? And the way to think about that and, and what the better GPS systems do is they don't just <laughs> look at what is faster right now, but if traffic develops, if there's an accident, which one gives you alternative routes more easily along the way? So that's just a brief uh, a metaphor for the kinds of work that, that for, for the way we think about the energy system. Um, the other thing that I'll say just briefly is we often like to talk about energy as a commodity and there are commodities, right? There's crude oil, there's natural gas, um, electricity to some extent can be treated as a commodity, but I think, um, you know, building on Chiara's remarks, another way to think about our energy infrastructure is that it is a very complex system that uses multiple fuels, multiple technologies, and we have multiple objectives that we want out of that system. We want low cost, we want reliable energy, we want resilience to natural disasters. We want low carbon. We want low particulate emissions. So, and it's provided by a mix of different for-profit companies producing different pieces of the system. And there are markets and regulations that govern how all of this fits together. <clears throat> so if you step back and you think about where does, what, what is gonna be a functioning system in some future year that is low carbon, the question is not, oh, how much wind energy do I need? The question is, what is the design from the perspective of what are the combinations of different technologies that we're gonna need to deal with all of the uncertainty, all the variability, and all of the different needs that we have on the system? So um, with that background, I'll just briefly tell you uh, a little bit about um, my research. So <clears throat> we are focused on the development of concepts, methods, and managing uncertainty within these uh, energy system design questions, right? So the main paradigm for our work is decision-making under uncertainty, specifically sequential decision-making un under uncertainty. So I'll give you a couple quick examples. Some of our work um, that we've been doing um, more with um, industrial partners in, in the electric power sector is traditionally the way a utility would plan what new power plants to, to build and invest in. They would look ahead maybe 20 years. They would pick one scenario of the future and they might even do two or three alternative scenarios, but they would try to pick one set of investments, an investment plan that builds out over 20 years. And essentially they would pick a, an investment strategy that works best 
for the, the best, you know, the reference projection for the scenario. So if that prediction of the future is true, you picked a design that's gonna work great. The problem is that when things are different than you expect, a lot of times that strategy turns out to be not very flexible, not very robust and performs very poorly if conditions are a little bit different than you predicted. So we've been working with uh, a number of partners to develop better tools that they can use in their planning that explicitly look at, here are a bunch of different um, projections of scenarios and we, we only have to choose let's say the next five years, what are the next set of investments we're gonna make? Then when we learn more about which of those paths we're on, we can make different choices after that. Knowing that, what's the best first step? So you're always working backwards. Um, another area that's, um, that we're working on is, um, in addition to the long-term uncertainty, the kinds of energy system we're, likely to move to is gonna have a lot more uncertainty on very short time scales. So with a lot more wind and solar, with a lot more electrification of consumer devices where you might want them to charge at certain times because that's perfect for the grid, people will, consumers will do what they will do. There's gonna be a lot of variability in the demand and the available power for in any given moment and they're gonna to need to be other sources that can fill in the gaps so that it's still reliable. Um, so so we're, you need a way to be constantly planning for all of the utilities and the, and the regional uh, network managers. You need to be constantly looking at what are different ways that things might evolve in the next hour, which power plants should I be bringing online in case I need them? And so we're also developing market design structures to help them operate the system more efficiently. And the other advantage is that it would actually give a way to pricing the option value of having some of these other resources that can fill in when needed. Because if you don't provide proper in incentive for these other technologies, no one's gonna invest in them. So those are just two examples. Um, let me let me wrap up here because I think we want to spend more time during the Q and A. Um, what I think, just to be provocative, what I want to say is that we, you, I, anybody else, regardless of what they claim, we have no idea what the future mix of technologies or fuels should be for, let's say, a twenty fifty energy system that is lower carbon. We don't know. We can guess. The question is. What's a good first step knowing that whatever we guess is going to be wrong? How do we manage the uncertainty by taking flexible, sensible steps that acknowledge the uncertainty and acknowledge that we're going to change direction as we learn more? Um, so, um, so I guess I would just conclude by saying by focusing on these robust, flexible near-term strategies, which can adapt as conditions change, we increase the chance that our energy infrastructure will function reasonably well in which whichever of these many, many different possible futures we end up living in. So um, I'm not gonna be there to, to interact with folks today, um, but if folks are interested after today's event to explore ways that this approach, this way of thinking and these tools can, can help organizations that you work with, I'd be more than happy to follow up with you after the event. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> Finally, I'd like to introduce Seth Blumsack. Seth is a professor of energy policy and economics and international affairs and director of the Center for Energy Law and Policy at Penn State. His expertise is in the electric power and natural gas industries, reliability and resilience and network infrastructure, organizational decision-making for infrastructure management, and regulation and deregulation in electric power. Even when economics and technology are perfectly aligned, poorly designed legal and regulatory frameworks can thwart the deployment of innovative energy strategies by raising barriers or increasing uncertainty. Penn State Center for Energy Law and Policy uses an interdisciplinary science-based approach 
to identify legal and regulatory solutions that can lay the groundwork for energy innovation and more sustainable energy systems. Seth will highlight the center's efforts in multiple areas, including methane emissions regulation, geological carbon sequestration, and home energy efficiency to illustrate its unique approach to interdisciplinary policy analysis and stakeholder engagement. Seth. All right, thank you. Um, am, I, am I on? Can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, so uh, first of all, um, I, I, I have to apologize really quickly. I have young kids at home, and so I've now gone back to the point where I'm constantly getting over a cold. So, <laughs> um, so I, if my voice is a little squeaky or hoarse or not your sort of typical booming professor voice today, uh, I, I apologize for that. Um, so um, I, I started my, my career as an academic um, doing uh, a lot of the kinds of, you know, kind of more technical work that, that my colleagues Mort and Chiara are really, really good at. And honestly, they were better, better at it than I ever was. Um, and, you know, a, a, a few years ago, I, I realized that I was kind of tired of going to all of these meetings that all ended with basically the same thing which was, yeah, we have all sorts of technology that we could use right now to decarbonize this, that, and the other thing and make our energy systems more secure. But, you know, we just really need people to make better decisions about using it. And I was like, okay, well, if we need people to make better decisions, how do we actually get them to do that, right? And this is kind of how I got um, more, um, this is how I got kind of more into, into the law and policy world. Um, um, so the, 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 the Center for Energy Law and Policy was um, created kind of with, with two aims. It, um, so it was created, um, one, uh, as, uh, you know, as, as a mechanism or a vehicle to harness just the incredible breadth and depth of expertise at, you know, at, at Penn State, kind of across the Penn State system and to be able to bring that to problems at the interface of you know, energy, technology, regulation, and society. Um, but it was, it was also created, and you know, it, it was also created to deal with this kind of very kind of thorny, difficult question in, in, in regulation, right? And this is kind of the question that, that animates a lot of what we do, is not just how do you, you know, how do you design regulatory systems that are going to encourage innovation and encourage the adoption of new technologies, right, rather than, you know, as Dean Cum said, thwart those things, okay? Um, but how do you design, um, you know, you know how, how do you design regulatory systems that are flexible enough to be, to, you know, to, to be able to handle and integrate and embrace you know, changes in, in, in uh, science and technology, right? And uh, also changes in kind of the, the organizational structure of which sorts of institutions are doing different things in the energy world. Um, and so to, you know, and, and it's really kind of that question, which is very thorny, that, that um, animates a lot of what the center does, right? And so, um, you know, typically what we will do is we will put together interdisciplinary teams, right, of, of you know, faculty, researchers, students, right, and, um, you know, really, you know, really try to understand how legal and regulatory frameworks, um, you know, could be made more, you know, could be made more adaptive to changes in technology, right, and to changes in, you know, and, and to changes in, in organizations and institutions. Um, and so just sort of, sort of a couple examples of this. Um, when, we, you know, one of the very first um, efforts that the, the center organized was around the, the regulation of, of, of methane emissions, right, from unconventional oil and gas operations. Right, and, and at the time, a lot of the action was really kind of happening at the state level, because there were, you know, federal rules around this were, were kind of up in the air. Um, and 
you know, one of the things that we found was that, you know, there were, you know, there were kind of big gas producing states like Pennsylvania that had regulatory frameworks that were very, that were very, very technologically specific, right? They had kind of very detailed, uh, they had kind of very, very detailed um, requirements for, uh, you know, for basically for, for leak detection, monitoring, abatement, all that, all of that sort of stuff, okay? Um, and that's great. I mean, it's super clear, right, what you have to do, um, but it, it made it hard to do a couple of important things, right? One was to, um, you know, one was for, uh, you know, not just companies, right, but also, um, you know, also some, some, some nonprofits who were interested in this space, right, to bring in kind of new technologies and new approaches for just trying to figure out where, you know, where big methane leaks were happening and why. Okay, um, the sort of other big, the, the sort of other big problem, right, which uh, maybe many of you will, will recognize from various contexts, um, is that it, it had a very difficult time adapting to changes in the cost of different mitigation technologies, right? And so, um, and so there wasn't any kind, you know, there, there, was not any kind of kind of an explicit kind of cost benefit test or anything like that kind of built into the framework, okay? And um, and so you know we compared a system like that, okay, with you know what we saw going on at the time in a place like Colorado, right, where um, which did not have the same kind of technological specificity as at, you know as 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 Pennsylvania did, right. But you know, rather, what it what it basically was set up to do was to get regulators and 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 industry, okay, to essentially collaborate on a plan, right? And the you know the the the, the state and regulators had they they had their goals for what what kinds of you know kind of what what kinds of um, you know, leakage reductions that, that, that they wanted to see, okay, and kind of what they had basically set up was a system to encourage, you know, to, 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 to encourage operators in, in Colorado, okay, to basically kind of, you know, work with regulators to, to come up with plans, okay, and that, you know, it's not as, it's, you know, it's, it's not as specific and, um, it, you know, it, it, it has the potential to be what, you know, as a geeky economist, right, I would call a very high transactions cost process, right, because it, you know, it could sometimes take, take a while for, you know, for, for operators in the state to kind of figure out um, what, what, an, what an acceptable plan looked like, okay, but it, it seemed more able and more well set up, right, to adapt to to, to changes in, in technology and cost, okay? Um, and so, you know, this is an example of kind of the kind of regulatory framework that, um, that you know, is, is able to facilitate that, that kind of adaptation. Um, when, you know, a, a couple of years ago, um, when the, the, the center looked at um, at Pennsylvania joining the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, um, that, you know, that was a process that um, involved kind of a much more fundamental, you know, that, that involved a kind of a much more fundamental legal issue, which was who gets to decide if Pennsylvania does this, right? Is this the governor's decision? Is it the decision of the state legislature? And, um, you know, part of the reason that this was so controversial, right, was that kind of the relevant, um, it, it was, was that the kind of the, the relevant air quality statutes in Pennsylvania were not ever designed with an organization like the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative in mind, right? And so it was, um, you know, and so 
it, it wound up being very inherently vague, right, as to who actually had, you know, as to like who, who actually had kind of the, the jurisdiction, right, to decide whether Pennsylvania could make this move, okay? Um, and um, just, you know, uh, if, if any of you keep track of this, then, then you know that we still have not figured this out in Pennsylvania, right? It's still kind of very much up in the air. Um, we, um, the, um, the, the center has also looked at areas where you, with, where, um, you, you know, where you have regulatory systems that, um, are kind of very, very balkanized or, or, or separated, okay, and at the time that these things were set up, that, makes that 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 may have made a lot of sense um it, you know as the world changes right it makes increasingly less sense right and so one of the uh, one of the efforts that the center is coordinating right now okay which is really a question about um improving regulatory coordination and alignment is is um is 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 around the the deployment of of energy efficiency of you know basically energy efficiency interventions for um, in particular rural and low income areas, right? And um, you know rural and low income areas, right? If they you know if, you know if, if we can deploy energy you know if we can make homes more energy efficient, that's great. It saves people money, right? This is a good thing. Um, as it turns out, it also in a lot of cases, really improves indoor air quality, right, and reduces things like mold, right, and actually make and actually can make people healthier. Okay, um, and so there's this, you know, so so there's this there's this kind of potential for um, kind of a great deal of alignment between public health goals, again, especially for poor and rural areas. Right and uh, you know and and energy efficiency goals, um, but from from kind of from a policy and regulatory perspective, um, these um, you know these these worlds are are very very separate, right? And um, and so um, you know one of the things that the kind of the the center has been doing is. We've been working with some groups in the in the Philadelphia area um, to uh, basically on what I would call a giant experiment, um, which is uh, to basically try to use uh, public health dollars like like Medicare, okay, to deploy energy efficiency investments on the grounds that it will make people healthier, right, and will reduce burden on the public health system, okay. Um, and so, you know, part of this is a regulatory alignment question, right? Part of it is a question about which technologies to deploy. Um, the the sort of the, the the last thing that I'll 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 talk about just because it's something I'm particularly excited about, um, and then we can get to questions. Is um, you know is is that um, with uh, support from uh, kind of a few different private foundations. Um, we um, have launched a pretty large scale effort looking at the governance of the power grid, right? And so uh, any of you who live in this state, right, are, you know, are, are sort of painfully aware of how bad things can get when the power grid doesn't work. <laughs> um, so, um, um, and so what, we have been doing kind of through this effort, right, is to look at how organizations like, you know, like, like ERCOT, right, and kind of the, the other regional grid organizations, uh, you know, in, you know, primarily in, in North America, right, both those that exist, like the, the, the PJM grid operator that, you know, that, that covers my state of Pennsylvania, Right and um, emerging regional grid organizations like those happening in the Western U.S. Um, and and trying to understand how these organizations make decisions about how reliable you know your electricity is, how you know how how new technologies are going to be integrated into the grid, 
And, and one of the things that we have found looking at how these organizations make decisions is that these organizations are by and large really, really good at putting together what I call coalitions of no, right? So um, they're, they're, um, you know, they're, they're kind of their internal decision-making structures uh, are sort of very well set up to say, no, we don't want to do this. They are less well set up at saying, well, okay, how do we do this new thing? Right? How, like, how can we bring new technologies like, like energy storage, right? Right? On, you know, on, onto regional grids to make them more reliable and, and more resilient as we, you know, you know, as we bring lots of renewables onto the grid and as we move towards uh, electrifying a lot more stuff than we used to. Um, so, um, and I, I, I bring that up because it, you know, it, it highlights kind of another aspect of um, the kind of this, this overall technology transition that, that I think is very important, which is that, you know, it's not just about, you know, you know, it's not, you know, it's not just about new technologies and policies, right? But it's also about, uh, you know, sort of going back to what I started with, right? Getting, you know, organizations, right? To make, uh, you know, to 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 make decisions that are are you know really going to encourage that that are really going to encourage innovation and moving our you know as Mort said really complex energy systems right in the directions that we want to see them go. So with that, uh, I'm going to stop. I'll turn it back over to Dean Kump. All right. Thanks, Seth. <laughs> okay. Like I said, we have. Um, 20 some questions that, and uh, that you've submitted uh, in, a, in advance of the event and we're not likely to get to all of those but um, but uh, try to pick some that, that I think might be particularly relevant to the discussion today and there were a couple um, that were related to um, the panel's um, uh, considerations of what are the some of the easier aspects of energy transition to a Low and uh, low carbon or zero carbon um, energy system, and and also um, you know what are the more challenging ones, and and which ones uh, have you encountered or expect to encounter in your in your research and um, teaching? And Mort, I might start with you uh, because um, you you talked about uh, decision making under uncertainty, and um, maybe put you on the spot a bit here around. A uh, paper that you um, recently published, I think it's an environmental science technology that I I happen to really like, and maybe you could uh, taught you know use that use that scenario that you evaluated using your your modeling um, uh, to to uh, to discuss some of these challenges and you know the and what the model said were were sort of the most successful. Um, approaches and so maybe just kind of flesh out what you were talking a little bit uh, about earlier about those initial decisions and and maybe give the crowd here a better sense of of that particular application of your modeling approach sure um thank you so um <clears throat> the so the, the question i think that that the dean is launching off from was what are the easier and more difficult aspects of transitioning to a largely zero carbon energy system? And then the, the paper that he referred to, the, the, the work that we've done, um, was basically looking, for example, if you wanted to take a big region of the US electrical grid and by 2050, remove 80% of the carbon dioxide, um, just, just as, a, as a goal. But if you wanted to do that, what would be the new technologies, the new types of generation that you would build, and which of existing types should you retire and basically take offline um, over the next 30 years? And if you do that with a sort of a typical projection of you know, how technologies will advance, what the costs are gonna be, what natural gas prices might be, you, you would get one answer and so that says, okay, build this much of each of these technologies. But when you open it up and say, given what we've seen in the last even 20 years, 
how can you say that the price of natural gas in 2050 is going to be, you know, three, $3.50, right? People you often have not seen price changes coming a couple months in advance. So we're constantly getting whacked by reality. So if you, if you instead say, let's generate a thousand plausible futures, because each of these technologies could cost a little more, a little less, gas could cost a little more, a little less, it'll bounce around. And then you ask the question, what would you want to, what, what would you want to add to the system and what would you want to retire of existing in the next 10 years, knowing that then in each of those futures, you can then make the rest of the investments knowing better how things are unfolding and how technologies are performing. In general, what we find shouldn't be surprising to anyone in, in this room with your with your expertise, which is that the smart thing to do in the near term is to have a much broader portfolio of technologies. One of the things that we did in that paper was we, we did experiments where we said, let's just not just take our, what, what our method considering uncertainty recommends, but compare it to some of the prescriptions that have been offered by some in which there are people who argue for eliminating certain technologies. We're just not going to do that anymore. Take that off the table. Or certain technologies, we have to have that, just make that be there. And what you find consistently is that anything that pre-decides that certain technologies should be simply off limits or forced to be there perform badly in a lot of the futures, not all of them. There are always possible futures we might end up in where that will turn out to be a good choice. But across the range of what could happen, that tends to be not good. So circling back to the question, I mean, what I would argue, what I've seen is that the hardest thing about this energy transition is that all of us in all organizations that we sit in can easily fall in the trap of saying, I think I know what we should do. Let's just do that and rushing to judgment rather than looking at this as a long-term evolution that needs to be paced and needs to allow flexibility. So, Great. Thanks, Matt. Mort, any, any other uh, response to that general question of the easy and hard parts of energy transition? Do you want to go? <laughs> go. Um, so this is a kind of a more general comment, uh, not necessarily related to oops, to issues that, that I've encountered in my work, but I think a, a big problem is that uh, some sectors are very hard to decarbonize. I see that as a, as a very big challenge of, of this transition. Um, so when we talk about the transition, usually people think about the electric power sector, and that's because wind and solar, of course, are uh, there, there's a path right to zero with with wind and solar, but but electricity really accounts only for about 28 percent of the global greenhouse gas emissions. Next, you move to the transportation sector, right? Lithium ion batteries have made it possible to for us to see a net zero future for travel, for car travel, I should add. But once again, cars only. Um, account for less than half of the transportation sector, which is about 16% of those emissions I was referring to. Lithium ion batteries don't do much about emissions from long distance travel in airplanes uh, or even heavy duty trucks. The, the one sector with the most emissions, which is about 31% uh, of the total is industry. And there are currently no cement plants in the world uh, that don't produce uh, CO2 emissions. And, and one of the biggest challenges is, once again, we, we, we cannot, with present technology, uh, effectuate a transition in, in, in part of the industry. For example, there's no technology that, that I'm aware of that's commercial and economic to produce, for example, steel from, from hydro or from solar. And so for the moment, we, we just don't have the technology to get off uh, natural gas in, 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 that, in that industry. And so once again, to go back to the question, I think, I think a, a big challenge and a big need is to 
think about and invest in, in clean technologies to replace every emission intensive process uh, that we have that we have today. Thanks, Kara. Seth? Yeah. Um, I, so, I, I mean, as somebody who has been sort of a student of the electric power industry for 20 some odd years, I'm, I'm surprised and, and honestly kind of amazed at how um, how easily kind of some of the like some of the, the grid operators have been able to absorb pretty massive amounts of of, of you know of wind and solar um, and you know there are times in like in the ERCOT grid right or in the SPP grid which is just north of ERCOT right where you know th those systems are running on like 70 some odd percent wind um, and they just, you know, they don't, um, they don't seem to have been major reliability issues with that. And that, that to me is, um, something that I, I, I think, um, has been very kind of, very kind of pleasantly surprising. Right. And it's not, I mean, and there are, there are, you know, there, are, there are other places in the world that, that, um, have have been able to to um, accomplish this. Um, I I think um, you know I, I mean in turn and so I, I I sort of bring that up as something that um, when I sort of started looking into this stuff uh, you know 15, 20 years ago I you know people thought this was going to be massively hard and uh, it turns out to have. Um, to, to have been smoother than I think we had originally anticipated, which is great. Um, in you know, I mean, in terms of things that are, um, in, in terms of things that are that are hard, um, I I think you know, as as Kiara mentioned, I think that there um, you know there there are some genuine challenges with um, you know with some you know with with some some parts of industry and. You know, maybe with um, kind of the you know the current federal push for hydrogen and kind of some of the expanded incentives for you know carbon capture and sequestration, right? Some of those kind of in, you know some some of those technologies will kind of finally get off the ground. Um, I I think um, the uh, another aspect of this which we haven't talked much about. Um, which is is I th I think is is difficult um, you know is which I I I think is difficult is uh, you know is is a little bit more on the demand side right um, so you know in the developed world um, we you know are you know in in the the developed world. Right. If we are going to decarbonize transportation, then we need people to to buy electric vehicles, right? And you know, and so, um, and and so, uh, you know, we're we're going to need, you know, we're we're going to need individuals, right, to be able to, you know, we're we're going to need them to make those those kinds of choices. Um, in the developing world. Um, there's, you know, I, there's, I think, um, a challenge in, you know, really increasing energy access, okay, without kind of further contributing to, uh, you know, to, to the, the, the climate change problem, right? And so I, I think kind of how we can, you know, how we can deploy um, you know how, how we can how we can deploy low carbon technologies to bring energy to places that don't have the same level of access that we do. I think that's that's I think that's that's another big challenge. Great, thank you. Well, um, sort of following up on that consumer decision making process, we have a question that, that read from the orange vest protest in France to the lack of free market demand for responsibly sourced gas. We see a rejection from consumers to be the ones who directly pay for a transition and change the demand profile. When exactly, did, or when exactly does this panel think that will change? 
and maybe how is part of that question as well. So who would like to tackle that one first? Maybe if I can build on something that Seth mm -hmm. mentioned, I, I think we need to drive the cost of new clean technologies down so that they can compete and, and consumers will, will then choose them and change their, their behavior. And a, a good example that I, I, in this direction, that I recently read about is related to the tax credits under the, um, for electric cars, of course, under the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, several companies, including uh, Tesla, they, they've, they've cut their, their prices across their model lines and the reason is that the Inflation Reduction Act has automakers scrambling to make adjustments to help their models qualify for funds under the new EV tax credit structures. And among the uh, rules for, for eligibility are uh, price thresholds in addition to buyer income and, and other elements. So I, I think that's a very good way of trying to incentivize the, the consumers and, and another thing related again to the era is that the era provides tax credits for um, used clean vehicles. And, and that's important because it improves access to, to this important uh, clean energy technology for buyers for whom a new electric cars is, is out of financial, financial reach. So again, to go back to the question, when will that change? I think we need to do more of this. We need to, to, uh, to drive the cost of these technologies down so that, that we can direct and, and shift the behavior of the consumers. Seth, anything else you'd like to add to that? <clears throat> um, I, so I, I don't totally know when it is gonna change. Um, I, you know, I, maybe, I, maybe I'm too much of an economist, right? <laughs> um, but I, um, I, I have, so I, I'm not, I, I don't know if we are going to see the, the, the day where lots and lots of people are going to, you know, where are, you know, are, are going to, uh, you know, happily and voluntarily, um, you know, sort of go along with, paying, <clears throat> you know, paying a lot more, right, for, um, you know, for, 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 for energy use, right, or, are going to, you know, or are, you know, going to agree to, um, you know, to going back to, to living on dirt floors, right, to reduce their, you know, kind of to, to, you know, to reduce their, their, their energy footprint. Um, I, I think, you know, you know, kind of situations like, I don't remember if it was the yellow vest or orange vest, um, but kind of the, the, the protests in France around fuel prices. Um, I, I think that that, is I, I think that is symptomatic of kind of a, a part of this you know a, kind of a part of the, the broader energy transition right that we maybe need to sort of think a little more deliberately about right I mean it's we, we think about it very much as a you know as a technology transition to achieve more sustainable energy systems right which is which is great um but there's there's an aspect of you know there's there's an 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 aspect of of this transition okay which is uh, you know probably going to involve some level uh, some some level of, of 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 social policy right because you know if we you know if, if we if we make certain fuels more expensive okay and lots of people you know, in the short term anyway, are, you know, are basically locked into using those, right? That's, um, that, you know, for a lot of people that winds up essentially as like, as something, something like a regressive tax. Okay. And, um, you know, that may, you know, may well fall, you know, more heavily on, you know, poor people, right. Or other populations that, you know, we're, we're, we're concerned about. Um, and so there's, um, it, I think that there, there, there is an aspect of this technology transition that maybe we roll it into, you know, into kind of what we think of as, as like equity considerations, right? Of 
you know, how do we, you know, how do we keep moving the, the technology transition forward? Okay. Um, without, you know, without kind of undue, without, without effectively undue burdens on, um, you know, on, on particularly vulnerable segments of the population. Thanks. Mort, anything you'd like to add to this? Um, no, I think not on this question. Thanks. Okay. Thanks very much. We have, we had a few questions, um, that hinge on, um, uh, energy education and, and, you know, as, as the world undergoes energy transition, so too does a place like Penn state have to, um, adjust its, its energy, um, education and curriculum. So had a couple of questions in that regard. Um, one was why does Penn state still have a petroleum engineering faculty? The entire fossil chain is being phased out. So too should these programs and we should fully move to ET. Um, second was what advice do you have about trying to train and recruit a workforce to the fossil fuel industries needed to sustain the transition? How do we attract and retain talent during the challenging period of, of service intermittency? And um, how are individual programs within the college adjusting their curriculum to align with the ongoing new energy trends? How do the departments emphasize the importance uh, of ongoing and the ongoing role of fossil fuels um, and, and how those will play into the global energy supply? So a lot there around um, energy curriculum, and I'm wondering if we could get some response from, uh, from faculty from our energy and mineral engineering department. <laughs> So I, I, I heard you all laugh. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I, but I think, you know, I mean, I think the, the question that um, kind of that, that Lee raised is, is, a, is, is a pretty serious one, right? And it's a question I've been asked before. Um, and, you know, the, the, you know, I mean, every, everybody laughs at the why does Penn State still have petroleum engineering, right? Um, but it, it, you know, it, um, it, it it is it is I, it, it is I think a serious question, right? Because you know if you know if Lee is going to hire a new professor, right? And of course you should encourage him to hire lots of new professors. Um, you know if if you you know if you know if you if you truly believe that in ten years we are not going to be using oil and gas anymore, then why, you know, I mean, why would you train people to go into this, you know, into this field that, that is not going to exist, right? Um, and so um, kind of aside, the, the way that I sort of think about this is, is aside from the fact that like in 10 years or 20 years, like we still will be using these, these resources. I don't really realistically see, see any way around it. Um, I, I think that if we are like if we are actually serious about you know about um, you know transitioning to a, a zero carbon energy system or a near zero carbon energy system or a less carbon energy system, whatever you want to call it, okay, um, then I, I think that you know that I, I think that you know we we, we have to take technologies right or approaches like like carbon capture and sequestration i think we have to take them very very seriously right and um and what you know and in order to take you know in order to really you know basically build a workforce around this stuff right there is um just uh, there's this just kind of wealth of subsurface science and and knowledge right that has been built up in kind of the petroleum and natural gas engineering fields, right? That I don't think we can lose, <laughs> right? And so, you know, in 10 years, maybe our petroleum and natural gas engineering curriculum, maybe it looks a little bit different, right? Maybe there's, you know, uh, maybe there, maybe it has, um, you know, more of a component on you know, I mean, may, maybe it has more, you know, may, maybe it has more of a component on, you know, on, on injection rather than production, right? Maybe, I don't know that. Um, 
But I, I think these, these kinds of skills, again, if we, I think if we are really serious about, about decarbonizing our, our, our energy system, um, I think that these are skills that we don't just need them now, right? But I think we are also going to have to train kind of a, another 30 or 40 years of our, our workforce, you know, right, in, in these, you know, in these skills so that, um, you, you know, so that we are, you know, so, so that, you know, we, we, are, we are able to deploy some of the technologies that I think we'll need. Karen? And I think just to make, I mean, completely agree with what, with what Seth is, is saying, but I would also argue that even if, like in 2050, if you look at virtually all the predictions that are out there, even if no uh, CO2 is emitted on a net basis in 2050, we will still be consuming about 25% as much oil and natural gas as today. So we will not be consuming zero. So of course, there's an issue of training and, and kind of uh, adapting the skills of, of, of the petroleum engineers of today, but we will continue to use oil and natural gas until 2050 and probably beyond. So, so it's not, um, I, I think maybe there's this myth that we will be able to transition to 100% renewables and we will not be using fossil fuel in 2050. But I, I don't think that that's, um, that's really true. And yeah, we shouldn't, we shouldn't think that that's gonna be the case, yeah. Morton, anything to add to this? <clears throat> yeah, um, thank you. I think what I would add is um, what, what I've seen change uh, in the nine years since, since I was fortunate enough to come and, and uh, join um, the college at Penn State. Um, I think we, the faculty and the students and the companies that come to recruit it are all recognizing how fast things are changing and how much things are going to continue to change. And a lot of what we've been doing, and this is many of us in the department, including the three of us here, but several of our colleagues, is building in a lot more training across all the, the energy majors on statistics, on managing decisions under uncertainty, on economics and markets, um, that the, the days where an electrical engineer just needed to understand, you know, voltage and amps and, and restrictions on lines, and the petroleum engineer only needed to understand like the fundamentals of traditional drilling equipment, those days are gone. Our students what we've been recognizing and the students have been asking for is more machine learning, right? More data managed, uh, more data mining, more ability to think rather than, oh, we'll teach you the technology that's used today because it's going to be useless by the time they get hired. What we need to train them in is how to think agilely. And a lot of the changes we've been doing in the college have been bringing in that as a piece of the curriculum still keeping, of course, the fundamentals that you have to have about the engineering and the science of, of energy, right? So I think that's been a big change that we've heard the demand from employers and students, and that's a lot of where our efforts have been. Okay, thanks, Mort. Yeah, and, and let me just say that, that I agree 100% with what the folks here have said. We really um, focus on developing skill sets, broad skill sets, in our students so that they throughout their careers can 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 adapt as the as the needs of the energy sector evolve and i know in talking with many of you what you're doing today is very different than what you were um, doing right when you uh, left penn state as petroleum engineers for example and and uh, so i think um, there you know and i do get that question asked quite often why are you still why do you still have petroleum engineers um, at Penn State? So, so, so we laugh, but you could imagine I get that question quite often as, as, as a dean. And for all the reasons that you've just heard, we have a strong continuing commitment, uh, maybe growing commitment to, to um, sustaining and, and, and uh, growing energy and real engineering at, at Penn State. And uh, that's going to continue in the foreseeable future. And I think it's the right decision. And, and, um, it uh, is is what we we can do best. Okay, um, 
let's see here, number of questions. I don't mean to be jumping around, so let me just scan ahead here. You know, there's, there's consumer decision making, and so this is sort of an interesting question for the general public. Um, such a transition plan as what we've been discussing here is complex with so many dynamics that, that change energy economics and therefore consumer choices. For example, should I buy a new car now? And so this is, I mean, I'm at that point. I got my 2006 Mini Cooper that, uh, that at some point I'm going to have to give up. Uh, so, for example, and I didn't write this question, but, uh, <laughs> but, it's, but it's relevant. For example, should I buy a new car now? Um, and if so, and it doesn't, you don't factor in my 2006 Mini Cooper into that question specifically. But, um, uh, and if so, what type of power system? So what are the least certain parts of the transition and why? Who wants to help me out here? <laughs> Mark, um, so I, I also have that? a 2006 Mini Cooper, and, and oh, really? don't, don't ever give it up. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> good answer. <laughs> um, so, what are the what are the least certain what are the least certain parts of the of the transition? Um, I so. Um, I, I think the, the least certain parts of the transition, and this is going to sound, um, it's going to sound a little squishy, but I don't really mean it to be squishy. Um, so I, I think the least certain parts of the transition, you know, it, in particular, like as a, as a consumer of energy using goods, like a, a lot of energy using goods, um, is how the kind of how these, different, um, you know, how these, how these different goods and, and systems are, are going to fit together or are not going to fit together. Okay. So just like, as an example, um, I am also thinking about buying a new car. Okay. And, um, I live, you know, I, I live in, you know, even by central Pennsylvania standards, a pretty rural area, right. And our power goes out a lot. Right, because we're in the middle of nowhere. All right, and um, that's I, not State College, by the way. No, 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 no. I, 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 no I live, I live way out in the hinterlands. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, and so um, I, you know, I've been, I've been really kind of entranced by kind of this idea of using like an electric car, right, to be able to like run my house. Okay when the power goes out every winter. Okay, right? And I was sort of got so entranced by this idea, I wrote like a little blog post about it, right? <laughs> um, and so, you know, I mean, right, so like right now, okay, I, I mean, you know, I could buy like the Ford electric pickup truck, right, which they claim could, could do that kind of thing, okay? Um, or, you know, I, or, you know, or, um, you know, or I could wait, right, and, and see if something better comes along, okay? And so I think the, you know, for, especially from a consumer standpoint, where I think there's kind of the most uncertainty is not necessarily whether things are going to get cheaper, right? Um, it, you know, the, like, costs for, you know, battery technologies and, you know, solar panels, I mean, they, they continue to fall at, at rates that I think are quite surprising. Um, I, I, you know, I think where there's, where there's kind of the, the, the most uncertainty is in, um, you know, is, is going to be kind of in the capabilities of, you know, of, of some of these, in, in, uh, you know, of, of some of these new technologies, okay, um, to, to be able um, to kind of achieve multiple things. Right. It's not just, you know, it's not just driving an emissions free car. Right. It's also like making my house more resilient. And I, I think I will add to that, like going back to my initial remarks. Um, so when, when we make in, in all of our models, we always think that there's going to be a linear adjustment, right, to some sort of equilibrium with investments growing in a linear, some sort of a linear fashion. If you look at the current events uh, that 
perhaps few could have predicted just a couple of years ago, this serves kind of as a reminder that it's very difficult to foresee events that shape the future of energy markets and affect the transition in completely unpredictable ways, right? So who could have predicted a few years ago what, what is happening right now? I think this is one of the least certain parts of the transition and one that we have a lot of problems dealing with in our models. And that's why we need more of the work, more modeling work that accounts for this uncertainty in a variety of ways, not just technological uncertainty, but also political and geopolitical uh, uncertainty. That's one of the least certain parts, in my opinion. So, uh, more, what kind of car do you drive? <laughs> no. Okay. Any, uh, any other comments you'd like to add, Mort? I, I, have, I have young kids, so I'm, I'm still a minivan dad. Right? So, <laughs> I'm sorry. So, the environmentalists can hate me, but I've got to bring my daughter and her, the rest of her teammates to volleyball. So, um, I, not to not to be dismissive of whoever posed the question, but I, I would argue um, from the perspective of consumer decisions, as opposed to major industry investments in infrastructure, I I think, and, you know, and Kiara was just alluding to this, a lot of these changes are not only difficult to foresee, but also they do take time. And the relative lifetime of some of the the consumer capital, buying a new car, putting solar panels on your roof uh, is much shorter. And you, I, so I think just a note of caution, I remember being a graduate student in the 1990s when California and Massachusetts passed these zero emission vehicle standards and said, by 2000, we'll have 80% of the cars will be electric. So not that they were wrong, but they were wrong about the timing. These things take time. And if you're buying a car, I mean, it's great if you want to drive your car for, for 20 years. That's hard to do in Pennsylvania because the body rots. So I think the real issue is large industrial and regulatory decisions and sort of market level issues. And consumer stuff is going to keep changing rapidly. The only other thing I would add is if there are ways, given the amount of uncertainty in all of these technologies and systems and how we might put it together, the ability to get consumers, some consumers to adopt, right? The laboratory for a lot of these things we're talking about will come down to having a subset of consumers willing to, you know, to try the next Tesla, right? And so if there are ways that we can create conditions so that some consumers will experiment, that's gonna be better for society in the long run. But as an individual consumer, I think you make the best decision you can and you're gonna revisit in five years. So sorry to be a, a, a downer on that. That's quite okay. You know, I've, um, even in my opening remarks, I threw, threw around the word sustainable, sustainable systems. Um, some of you know that we are exploring a school of sustainability at Penn State and, and EMS is, is uh, providing leadership in that regard, in part because we want the um, scope of what's being discussed around sustainability to include things that are brought up in this next question. And so the question is, why do you feel the definition of sustainable has been so closely tied to greenhouse gas emissions and climate change? Why has there not been a greater focus put on the sustainability of rare earth element mining for wind and solar technologies in regards to pollution, child labor atrocities, and dependence on China by the West? Have you seen progress in academia, both inside and outside of EMS, in using a broader, more complete definition of the word sustainable? So who would like to respond to that? Um, I, I'm willing to, to take a crack at it if, it's, if that's okay. Sure. Um, again, in the spirit of kind of challenging. So, so again, if I think back to when I was a young idealist, a graduate student, myself and, and a whole bunch of my fellow students were really excited about this idea of sustainable development. And we formed a little club and we read all these papers and, 
And this is when there were a lot of things at the sort of United Nations level, a lot of, um, this is when the, the framework convention on climate change was first passed. So early 1990s. And I think again, um, the problem with defining a word sustainable is it's a bit like a Rorschach, like everybody projects what they wanna see into it. And with so I think, there are important issues underneath, but unless you specify the underlying issues that, that you want to talk about, getting hung up on the definition of sustainable maybe is not where to focus. But in terms of the, the, the question, and, and I think Kiara can speak to this better than I can, given her expertise, but um, what I know from the early development of a lot of these um, international political movements is that there was an attempt in the late 1980s, early 1990s, particularly from developing countries to get attention to things like poverty and just other forms of pollution and that were really creating hardship. And whether it was intentional or unintentional, there is a view in political science that essentially the industrial countries turned it into climate change because you know some people would argue that 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 was something they could deal with this this goes way back is i guess my point this has been around developing for decades and so it is important now as the questioner asked to say like what are the other things we care about other than greenhouse gas emissions and that i think is the fair point whether or not we get define everything as sustainable though i think is is maybe not where to focus um, I don't know. Kira can probably correct anything I said wrong, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'm not a um, sustainability expert uh, by any stretch of the imagination, but I but I will say that my very first uh, paper, the very first paper that I published was um, the I was trying to develop a sustainability framework. I was measuring sustainability in a in a regional uh, network and and. There are like four key dimensions of sustainability, environmental, economic, technical, and, and social. I think the question speaks to the social part, which was the only part that we actually could not measure because we didn't have data that will allow us to measure the social, the social impacts. So we were able to measure the environmental, the economic, and the technical, but not, but not the other. Um, so since then, I, I didn't do more work on sustainability. I know uh, there, I have a, a colleague at Northwestern who came last year to visit uh, Jennifer Dunn. Uh, she's been doing some work on a social LCA, um, which is kind of complementing the environmental LCA is the life cycle analysis. So she, she's doing some work on social LCA, which is complementing the most traditional and typical environmental LCA. And, and I think then, so there, there is some movement to try and account for these social aspects in the definition of sustainability, but lack of granular data to evaluate these effects is, is definitely a problem. And, and so that, that's perhaps one of the reasons why this dimension has received a little bit less attention than the others, although it is certainly very important. Yeah. Jeff, anything to add? <clears throat> um, not, 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 not a lot. I mean, I think that the, I, you know, the, the, so, I mean, you know, climate is such a big issue that in some, you know, in, in some sense, it has tended to swamp every, everything else because it is kind of such a, you know, you know, because it is kind of such a big global scale problem. Um, I, I guess, I mean, I'll, I'll sort I'm not to, I'm, uh, you know, not, not to, not to disagree with the, the kind of the, the question per se. Um, but I, I think that um, there, I mean, I, I think that is, you know, especially over the last several years, I think that there has been uh, kind of a recognition that, you know, when you talk about sustainability, it's a very kind of high dimensional problem, right? It's not just about the environment. It's not just about climate. Um, and I think, you know, even, you know, if you look at kind of just the sheer number of like the UN sustainable development goals, for example, there's about 17 of them. Okay, that you know it it does carry with it kind of a lot of different goals, 
right? And, um, and you know, in, and hopefully kind of the idea is that, you know, we can make, you know, is that, you know, we can, we can make choices so, you know, to, to satisfy as many of those goals as possible. Well, well, thank you. Well, so, you know, we are exploring the school of sustainability concept um, at Penn State. And, you know, part of it was motivated. You probably heard Stanford received a $1.1 billion gift to establish its uh, door school of sustainability. Harvard has a new um, initiative around uh, sustainability and, and climate change. So there's a challenge for you, by the way, in terms of fundraising goals. <laughs> and if you happen to have a spare billion dollars lying around, uh, we, we, we could use it because frankly, when I, I actually know both of those um, programs really well, my, my former postdoc is a senior associate dean at Stanford charged with help um, uh, bringing faculty into their school. We are so f much further ahead at Penn State than either Harvard or Stanford is in in exploring sustainability, in, and in particular in our in our curriculum. So I think it's a real opportunity for us. But I think what differentiates us as well are the sorts of things you've been hearing today, and and what were brought up in the question is more of a comprehensive assessment of what does it mean to have sustainable energy uh, systems. What does it mean to have um, uh, su uh, sustainability in terms of, of the environment and, you know, concepts like life cycle assessment and, um, and supply chains and, and circular economies are all really important problems. So I think we will uh, advance along these lines uh, with all these caveats in, in mind and hope that this um, brings some added uh, dimensionality to what Penn State can offer uh, the nation. Well, we're, we're at the end of this uh, riveting discussion. I really appreciate the questions that were posed. I appreciate the participation of our faculty in this uh, panel. I do want to thank our crew here, uh, Chris Bryda and his team uh, for organizing the event and, and the Houstonian for their great work. So let's give them a round of applause. I also want to thank um, Bonnie Forge once again and, and, and the Leone family. You know, thinking about, so the faculty here today are part of our energy business and finance uh, program. And I think it's a unique aspect um, bringing the social sciences into what we have in our college. And it reminds me when I first met John Leon and I was asking him, you know, what, why has he been so generous to the college? And I expected a response um, like, like many of you have given me, it's, you know, that your generosity arises from some great experiences that you had with a particular faculty mem member, uh, Turgai Erdogan often comes up in, in that regard, um, and, and the experience that you had had at Penn State. John, John's answer was different. He said, I was looking at, at what you're doing in, in the college, and I really like this growth around energy business and finance. That to me is bringing in a, a new dimension. I want to provide support for that in uh, to the department um, at first and, and now to the college. So, um, so I really do think that's a great um, strength that we now have within the department and um, college. And I think it suits us well for the future um, in this era of energy transition. So to our attendees um, on online and, and to you, thanks for participating today. We have Time now, to the extent to which you have time, to, uh, to uh, mingle. Um, Seth and Chiara are here um, and would, I'm sure, be very happy to follow up with any other questions you might have. So uh, thanks again for attending and, and enjoy NAEP for those of you who are um, going there. And um, please stay in touch, reach out when you can and, and provide us input um, and, uh, and look to us for advice. So take care, everyone.